of recently published The Boatyard book, Simon Jolland. Hello, Simon. Hello, James. Um, and thanks. No worries. Uh, we have Simon here today to talk about some of the subjects covered in his book. Um, they're all based around projects you might be doing at this time of year when you have your boat out of the water and you're trying to get some much needed maintenance done ashore. Um, so, Simon, thank you again for joining us um, to talk about the topics in your book, uh, particularly relevant at this time of year. Uh, obviously, we can't cover the entire book, uh, so we're going to try and focus on getting what people might be thinking about when they're getting their boat out of the water and planning and looking ahead at some of the winter projects that you might consider. Um, but before we get into it, get into it properly, uh, do you want to give us a bit of a background on the book, who, who you wrote it for, who it's aimed at and how it came about? Yep, um, that would be a pleasure. So, uh, the, yeah, the aim of the Boatyard book uh, is to provide boat owners with some help and advice with the care, maintenance and repair of their boats. Um, by boat, we focus on sailing yachts and motorboats up to 15 metres or so in length. Um, I've owned a couple of 30 footers over the years. Um, yeah but currently have a 40 year old Contessa 26, which I refer, re refer to in the book uh, quite a bit as I've done a lot of work on, on the boat over the eight years of my ownership. Um, I'd say the target audience are um, competent sailors who might love being out on the water, but who may have limited experience of maintaining and working on boats themselves. And perhaps they're looking for a bit of guidance with how to improve their skills and knowledge. Um, that was me 25 years ago when I bought my <laughs> first sailing yacht, which was quite a leap. Uh, that was a 30 foot ETAP. Um, lovely boat, but uh, it was quite a leap after owning a Wayfarer dinghy. Um, so as owners, keeping a boat uh, safe and seaworthy is our number one priority. That means learning how all the various systems work on a boat, and how best to tackle the jobs that need doing and how to keep it in a uh, good condition. Um, it's tempting to leave all this work to professionals. Uh, tempting that is if, you, if you've got money to, uh, and you can afford to do so, uh, but it does get expensive. Uh, but what I would say is when you're at sea and you sometimes need to make repairs or deal with a breakdown yourself, uh, it really does, uh, it's really important that you know how to sort things out yourself. Uh, and it can be critical. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you've only, if you've never had a look at your engine or done any of your work on your boat, if it goes wrong, you are lost to do anything in the state of emergency, I guess, especially when you're at yeah. panic stations. Um, so before we get into it, uh, as always, if any of our live viewers uh, have any questions at any point about the topics we're talking about, then please feel free to ask us in the live chat. And if you're not watching live, um, you can drop questions in the YouTube comments or on our Facebook page, and either Force4 or Simon will get back to you directly. Um, Simon, let's get into it properly. The book is about yeah. projects to do whilst your boat is laid up in a boat yard, but what do you think people should really think about or consider before their boat is even out of the water? You know, what, what do we get? How do we get to a boatyard, essentially? <laughs> um, well, yeah, that's that's good. So, um, well, as the season comes to an end, uh, which it has done here, more or less, um, you know, being the end of November. But so as the season comes to an end, one of the top priorities is to do a bit of planning for the winter months. Um, where are you going to keep the boat uh, when it's ashore? What jobs are you going to undertake? Uh, what facilities might you need? Um, so thinking about that well in advance is important. Uh, it really helps to keep a maintenance log for your boat. Uh, and I do bang on a bit uh, about that in the book quite a bit. Keeping um, a record of what jobs need doing annually or every few years is a good good idea because it's really easy to overlook things especially on older boats uh, like my Contessa. Um, for example it's usually recommended that standing rigging should be replaced every seven years or so depending on usage 
but knowing when the seven years is up uh, would be quite useful. <laughs> and, I mean, and smaller things like when was the cutlass bearing last replaced or what about your rudder bearings? Uh, you know, uh, it's not something you do every year, but keep a note of it. And uh, it just helps you with planning, helps you with budgeting and sourcing spare parts and all sorts of things like that. So the same goes with the engine. Um, you know, keep a note of when you do your oil changes, filter changes, when you've replaced your anodes. Um, so that's one thing to be thinking about. And then um, you do need to be re realistic about the number of jobs you'll be able to do while the boat's ashore. I, I mean, say three or four months. I mean, I'm bringing mine ashore for three months, I think, this year. Um, that can go quite quickly. I, I, I tend to check through the things that need to be done annually. I mean, they, you really got to do them, you know, the hull work, engine maintenance, um, you know, the seacock servicing, that type of thing. Um, and then I uh, also think in terms of one or two major projects where time allows. So don't try and take too on, too much on is what, what I would say. Here. Um, I, and also, of course, booking the yard early is important as the best ones tend to be filmed during the winter months. Um, certainly around Chichester Harbour, which is where I keep my boat. Um, the yards normally have standard rates for lifting and storage mm -hmm. uh, according to boat length and time spent ashore. Uh, but you'll also need to hire a cradle if you don't own one or a trailer uh, on which to support the hull. Um, have a chat with the with the uh, yard about your boat and explain what you think needs doing when it's ashore. Um, you've got to make sure they're okay with owners working on their own boat. Some yards are a bit particular uh, about that. They don't really like the owners doing anything more than the basic maintenance. Um, so just double check on that. Uh, the important thing about maintaining that a good relationship with the yard is that they should be able to help you with expert advice, put you in touch with local engineers, uh, riggers and other specialists should you need them. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, plan ahead is what it's all about. No, that makes sense. I get I, I get what you're saying there. And like you say, have a have a conversation with a few yards, work out what you may what they can offer you or what they may or may not allow. I get the whole yeah. not not wanting necessarily owners to do a lot of work on the yard purely because of what might else be in the yard. You know, one of the yards that or well, one of the shops I used to work in, the yard there was also the car park. So they would be a bit particular because they'd be worried about things ending up on people's cars. Fair <laughs> enough, I understand that. So it becomes a bit of a messy problem. So once you've chosen your boatyard and you've decided on what you hope to get done over your next months, like you say, you, you've picked your necessary jobs and maybe some luxury jobs, what are the next steps you're going to take in terms of getting the boat ready for like lift out? Sure. Um I actually brought my boat ashore last week, so this is reasonably fresh in my mind. Um, and oh, I see a picture, but that that's where I brought it ashore, but that's not actually my boat. Just to, <laughs> not to, not to, to, just to clarify things. Um, so uh, yeah, the week before, um, I went to the boat and mm. I removed the sails, uh, took off the lazy jacks and running rigging as, as much as I could, really. Um, and then I, it was a nice day. So what I did, brought it alongside and I emptied the boat of anything that might uh, attract damp, like cushions, kits, sails, books, uh, galley equipment, you know, food, salt, sugar, tea, coffee, it all comes <laughs> off. Um, it's a bit, of a, sh a bit of a chore, but it's a good idea just to, you know, start emptying the boat before you come ashore. Because when a boat's ashore, of course, um, especially with a deep keel, it's, you know, so several feet above your head. So if you can just bring it, bring it alongside, it's much easier to offload it straight to the car. Um, so another important thing, you know, prior to lift out is to top up the fuel tank uh, before the winter layup. Uh, the, you know, this will prevent condensation forming inside the tank, which encourage, encourages the dreaded diesel bug. Um, that's the bacteria that clogs up fuel filters. So, uh, you know, top up your top up your tanks, really important. Uh, and those with uh, those are boats with holding tanks. Mine actually doesn't have a holding tank, but if you do have a holding tank, 
it's really best to pump those out before coming ashore. No, that makes sense. And that, like, uh, you, the way you talk about getting cushions and things out, uh, my parents owned a boat for many years. Uh, I was a terrible son. I didn't do a lot of work on it. But one, <laughs> one thing I was always, always roped in for was the annual pilgrimage of cushions from the boat into the attic yeah. or whatever else. And like you say, the entire like, galley of all this food, everything was emptied out. Just, you know, it's either going to go rock solid or it's just going to get damp and mildew and moldy. So, yeah, it was quite quite an undertaking and probably about as useful as I was anyway. Um, <laughs> so Yeah, we're actually looking around here. I've got, I've got a pile of sails over here. I've got <laughs> all, all bits of kit, you know. i got half the galley here. I mean, I... You can't see much behind me, thank God, but it, it's a bit of a mess in this room. <laughs> but so, I do feel, you know, I think it's good. It's nice on all this gear and equipment to bring it ashore. You know, you don't want to leave it on the boat to deteriorate. No, a lot of it's expensive. You don't want it to get damaged by the damp and the mold and the cold. So, no, that makes absolutely. sense. So, after all of that, and you've got your boat essentially ready and in a position to be lifted out, when it actually comes to the lift out, uh, what do people need to be aware of or should consider, do you think? Um, I mean, some of this might be blindingly obvious to people who, you know, used to it, but if those are not, um, I'll, I'll kind of spell it out a bit. I mean, I'd say call the yard the day before uh, you're due for the lift and check what time they want you to arrive. It's just, you know, common sense, but, you know, communicate with them because if you show up too late, I mean, you've got to know what... what time high waters and all that sort of stuff mm. um you know the, the, it's it just you know it's good to stay in, in contact and um i like to be there for the lift but some yards offer a collection service it's going to cost them cost you any more money of course but i i just like to be there um you also got you've got to make sure the yard if you haven't taken it out uh, at, at that particular yard, yard before your boat um they're familiar with the underwater profile of your type of boat. I mean, as we all know, the keels are loads of different shapes. You know, have you got a fin keel? Have you got a bilge keels? Have you got, um, you know, a, a long um, encapsulated keel? They're going to need to know that because um, they um, have to put slings or, um, you know, the crane um, has various um, strops, etc. So, um it is important that they know where the lifting points are. Uh, also check that they're going to power wash the hull after the lift out. Uh, that's that's a, an absolute must, but make sure you've requested for that to happen. Um, I also like to arrive a little early to have time to change the engine oil. You know, I motor up, say, to the yard and um, you know, with a warm engine, you can pump the oil out, oil out much more easily than uh, when it's cold mm. and the reason of course you need to change the oil um, at that time is that oil becomes very uh, old oil becomes very acidic and that can damage the engine over the winter so it's a really good plan to change your oil before um, before lift out. Uh, I also leave all the seacocks open so that uh, raw water cooling and plumbing can drain away during the lift uh, you don't want that staying on board uh, through the winter. Uh, also pump out the bilges. Um, leave the inside as dry as possible. And uh, then turn the batteries off, close the hatches, and hand the boat over to the yard. And, and oh, yeah, one last thing. Remember to, uh, you, you're going to need a ladder to get aboard the boat uh, <laughs> when it's ashore. <laughs> because otherwise it could look a bit of a fool. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yards have their own ladders, but they really like owners to supply their own and uh, I just keep it padlocked to um, to the cradle and um, yeah and then you know just hand it over to the yard don't get in their way let, let them just lift the boat out and and uh, maybe go home at that point um, because they're going to need a bit of time to chock it up and uh, get it in place and so what I tend to do is go back the next day or a couple of days later. No that makes sense and again like uh as someone who used to do a bit of boat graphics, boat naming and stuff like that, one of the worst things ever doing a practical job is having the owner breathing over your neck going, is that straight? Is that the right colour? Just, yeah, yeah, get out of the way, let them do their job and then it'll be fine. <laughs> so 
now the boat is ashore and essentially laid up and in the boat yard. I mean, I imagine it's, well, I know it's overwhelming to be the sense of where do you actually start? I mean, you might even, with your list of projects, you might, even with your list of projects, it's a case of which one do you prioritize or where do you start? I mean, what do you start to think of as like the route that you would take or recommend taking? Well, I think the first thing I do um, normally, because I haven't seen, you know, I mean, occasionally maybe twice a season, I give the um, undersides a scrub, but um, you do want to give your hull a good thorough visual check over. You, you want to find out whether there are any nicks in the gel coat, um, check the stays, the anti-fouling. Also, with older boats like mine, uh, you want to check for signs of osmosis, which um, are the blisters and bubbles that might start appearing. Um, over the last couple of years, I actually have had quite a lot of that, and um, we managed to uh, nip it in the bud reasonably, I think, with the help of the yard. Um, so, yeah, you want to give your, the undersides a really thorough look, because uh, if there's anything major there, you're going to, that, you know, the most important thing is to work on the hull uh, when it's ashore, because you're not going to be able to do that um, when it's in the water, of course. Uh, immediate things to do below decks would be the engine winterization. That is an important thing to do. Um, I, although I've been winterizing the same engine for the past eight years, I still consult <laughs> the engine manual every time because, you know, it's amazing how you forget these things. Um, but there are certain jobs to do there. You know, if your engine has raw water cooling, uh, you need to disconnect that uh, the water in that hose and dip it in a bucket of fresh water and run the engine for 15 or 20 seconds to make sure that you're not leaving any salt water in the cooling system over the winter. Um, it is probably a good idea to check with the yard whether they're okay for you to do that because, um, you know, it makes mess, but, um, you know, it's uh, just good manners, really. I check that they're happy with that. Um, then uh, on the engine, you can loosen the alternator and the water pump drive belts. Um, that will take you three minutes, but it will extend their life. And, um, you know, if they're all under tension all the time, they, you know, they they wear out more quickly. Mm. Uh, then, of course, there's antifreeze. Uh, antifreeze to the engine if you've got a, um, a freshwater cooling system. And uh, also for your hot and cold freshwater uh, systems around the boat. Um, I usually disconnect the batteries and take them home for storage. Uh, but... You know, again, doing so increases their life, especially if you keep them charged on a trickle charge um, over the winter. It, but however, this year I've fitted um, earlier in the year, I fitted solar panels for the oh, first nice. time and, uh, and a regulator. And so this year I'm going to leave the batteries on board and hope they survive the winter courtesy of the solar panel. But we'll see. Um, yeah, I'll keep a check on them and make sure they're holding their charge. But, you know, the solar panels brilliant. Uh, if anyone hasn't is contemplating uh, doing that same thing, I'd strongly recommend. Um, strongly recommend it. It's not too difficult to fit and really handy. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, from what, like I, the general feeling that I get from that is, it's best to start prepping the areas that cope well when they're being used a lot and in action that are now going to be sat left and cold and you don't you know you, you're treating those things that might seize up or be susceptible to the damp conditions ultimately and and things yeah. like that yeah okay yeah so i mean protecting the boat from the cold and damp over the winter is very important of course uh, but especially the damp and the cold itself is not really the issue unless it goes down to minus something horrendous um but the damp yeah that that can lead to corrosion and you know, mildew and, you know, generally um, is not good at all. So the key is to keep it dry and well ventilated. Um, one, and we've, we mentioned about taking kit off the boat, but if you haven't already done it, remove, I mean, I just think it's a good idea to remove bunk cushions. Others might not. Um, but, um, 
you know, go to all of that effort, especially if you've got an eight birth boat. That's not quite so funny, <laughs> but you know, four births. Believe um, me, every single come. every single cushion that was on my parents' boat came off. Every single <laughs> one. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> yeah, no, that's a lot of work. Oh, that, that's uh, I can see a picture of my interior. Of, oh, nice. Uh, uh, you can, I mean, there are four bunk cushions there, basically. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, also, you might go over, the, you may have, bear in mind, there's a lot of salt that gets into the cabin over the winter, so over the, sorry, over the season, the summer. And um, so it's a good idea to wipe all the surfaces with um, a sort of weak bleach solution and fresh water just to remove any salty residue and to prevent molds um, from forming. You can do that on the headlining as well, which is quite uh, quite a good idea. Also, double check your bilges are completely dry. Uh, so you do you want to keep the interior well ventilated. Leave cupboard doors ajar um, to encourage airflow, and um, check that the if you have air vents in your hatches, which I think is really important, these should be left open because you want the air to be able to circulate. Um, a dehumidifier is also important. That will help keep the interior dry. Uh, powered ones, obviously, are best, um, but not every yard um, will supply shore power for you. So if that's the case, the non-powered or passive dehumidifiers work well in my experience. And those are the crystal ones, the um, moisture-absorbing crystal yeah, type. Yeah. And I, I, I might buy half a dozen of those and just dot them around the boat. And, you know, they're really effective. Um, so those are the sort of things I'm doing, you know, early on. No, that makes sense. And like you say, a, you know, a power dehumidifier that you can drain through your sink is a wonderful thing. But if you haven't got the option of power, then yeah, the, the passive ones work very well. I think you just got to be aware that you, you, that's what you have and you've got to make sure you go down and check them every week or so yeah. and just replace them. Yeah. But they work just as well. And these all feel like pretty basic, achievable tasks, even for most sort of amateur boat owners. Um, a little bit of hard work or a bit fiddly, but nothing. It doesn't require a lot of technical know-how to get done. So no. I, I think once, you, once you've once you got through these basic things, because I, like you said, I think that's a good starting point. You, you know, you winterize this, you, you can do the easy preventative measures. What then are some of the bigger jobs or areas that you think people would consider or should have a look at or how they would go about having a look at it over the winter? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of potential jobs to do. I mean, it's just non-stop with a boat. That's the great thing about them, really. Um, <laughs> it's going to keep you busy. That's for sure. You, there's no excuse to be bored when you got a, when you own a boat. Um, but, well, my experience experience is mainly around sailing boats but so I'm sorry if I'm being the, the limelight I do cover uh, power boats and um, in the book itself but that's another story I mean it's the number one thing to be sure, really do need to be sure about is the state of your rigging so um, if in any, any doubt have a rigger a professional rigger check your rig over for you and uh, don't necessarily have to do then have to do it every single year but you know get just you need to get to know a rigger and uh, that will help you enormously and um book them early on they get really busy uh and they will just they'll be able to give things a good check and tell you whether there's a problem brewing and mm -hmm. uh that applies to both the standing and running rigging and the standing rigging generally it needs to be replaced on a on a yacht between every seven to ten years it just i mean it does depend on usage of course if you're if you're sailing around britain every every uh, summer then you probably need to have your chick your rig checked uh, annually but um it's um you know seven to ten years or so running rigging checks you can do yourself to a large extent but you've also you really got to be aware of the signs of wear in the lines and the blocks. Uh, you don't want things breaking um, when you're out at sea. Mm -hmm. So um, rigging is really, really important. Therefore. As for the sails, um, these you've taken ashore. Uh, you can, if you've got the space, uh, to try and clean and launder them yourselves. But to be honest, I tend to take mine to a 
um, you know, to a, a sailmaker and have them launder them, uh, and then they're off your hands, and they'll look after them. They'll check them over and do any repairs that you need doing, and keep the sails in good condition. So that that would be um, one of the things that takes up a bit of time, you know, taking them over to them. For power boats, uh, the engine and the propulsion system really does need major um, work on most years, and. Um, you know they i again i would su suggest most people unless they're engineers themselves would call in professionals uh, to to help them with that um therefore you need to contact those engineers before you bring the boat ashore book them up um it's not only the engine it's also the prop shafts and the stern gear uh these are quite big projects um if there's something wrong there that needs to be you need to know about that early on yeah uh, anodes it's not such a big issue because um you know they're fairly easy and straightforward to replace um same applies to yacht engines they um uh, uh, you know you need to check your steering system uh the rudder also needs checking for wear and maintenance um you know the list is going on and on here but um, <laughs> i was not quite sure where to stop but um <laughs> I I think definitely speak to the yard. Um, you know, if you if you think there's a big job to do, ask them about specialist services, and um, they'll be able to put you in touch with the the right people. And for very major jobs, um, re you know, major repairs, or if you've had a serious damage, for instance, and, and refits, the best place, in my view, is to start with. Uh, speaking to your surveyor, uh, the surveyor is going to give you a complete overview of your boat. Yes, for a, for a uh, cost, but um, they'll probably save you quite a lot of money in the long term. Um, so, um, does that does that kind of help? No, I think that helps. I mean, there are some pretty big jobs there, um, hmm. and like you say, we we could have done a chat just on that question or section probably for half an hour. But the thing I think to bear in mind something that you spoke about at the start of this is these jobs aren't always annual like there might be a quick glance and yeah you know there is certain bits like you, you know you might do a gasket or a seal and everything else but it's not going to be a complete overhaul so i mean it, it's obviously a good idea to check them every year but they it isn't necessarily a job or they all need work every year especially sure. if you are doing good running servicing i guess running maintenance I, th I think, yes, a lot of time can be just spent, you know, going over things and checking. And you might say, well, we could do that when the boat's afloat. Well, yes and no. I mean, when the boat's afloat, you really want to be sailing it as much as you can. And, uh, you know, especially if time's limited. So the more you can do, you know, sort of uh, when it's ashore, I think the better. Um, be aware of all the equipment you've got on your boat. It's going to be different, say, to any other boat. Um, you, you know the basics might be the same uh, and it's really important to have manuals for uh, just about every piece of kit you've got um, you can down if you haven't got them most of them are downloadable from the internet and um, you know you you can do your checks using those manuals it really does help um, so but I would go back to the importance of the maintenance log it really is handy um and i give it quite a bit of attention in the book i think for good reason you, you want to be able to keep a track of the projects and the work that's been done on the boat over the years and it's going to help you with your budgeting too so um yes number one no okay no that's great and i suppose what we have done here is or maybe not overlooked but it's easy to focus on the outside of a boat. That's where it's easiest to look and what's getting the most work. But obviously there's an interior as well and you've got pipe work and plumbing. I mean, what are the jobs that people or projects that people should consider internally, I guess? I mean, I know the engine's inside, but the rest yeah, of Yeah, the engine's, <laughs> the engine's inside. Um, how about a nice messy job uh, cleaning the sea toilet? Oh, that's yeah, lovely, right. isn't it? Servicing that. I think your parents had to do that on their boat. 
Uh, did you ever help them with it? Ripped into that one. Oh God, no. I mean, you can get kits for that. Uh, the most most sea toilets have that, and uh, it is again, you know, it's only too easy to overlook it. It's a pretty messy job, but once you, you know, once it's done, it's it's a good feeling. You know, it's it's over and done with. It's going to work again, um, and it's not going to cause embarrassment to any guests you might have on board. So. Um, yeah, I think that, but uh, also wiring work. Um, you need to check over your wiring and make sure there isn't, you know, the, the, the wires haven't been worn um, through the motion of the of the boat. And, uh, and one one winter, I, I actually did a complete rewire with the help of a very good friend of mine. We we <laughs> literally stripped the whole. You can see one or two pictures here. But we did strip the boat out completely of the, all the old wiring. It's 40 years of wiring and uh, it was a complete mess. And you come across these literally bits of bare wire, which um, are potentially very dangerous. You know, that that could cause a fire and yeah, certainly, yeah. you know, will account for equipment failure as well. So, um, yeah, but you do need to allow quite a bit of time to do a job like that. Um, so, um a big job, but very much well worth the effort. Um, you could check through all the plumbing joints. Um, you know, the plumbing is something not on a smaller boat like mine. It's not so much of an issue, but on some of the bigger boats, you know, where you've got several heads and showers and, um, you know, sort of that the, there's quite a bit that could go wrong and you know, work through that part of the interior if you can get access to it. Um, the sea cops, of course, need to be serviced. That's a fiddly, yeah, quite unpleasant job because of access, um, certainly on my boat. But <laughs> you can't ignore them. They've got to be done. You know, it's one of those things. And you can't do them when they're back in the water. So, you know, even on the, you know, the Blakes, uh, I, all my boat sea cops, I think, are Blakes, but some of my previous boats weren't. And, uh, you know, the the best, the best of the the best for a reason you know but even the best are going to need servicing so um yeah, even, even get if that done. As greasing just you know just to yeah. keep it running yeah yeah um another big job i did was revarnish the interior completely right literally strip the entire boat um of that oh. there it is halfway <laughs> through as if by magic <laughs> thanks elise <laughs> but so um, yeah that was a fairly bonkers job really but um yeah yeah you got the paint get the paint stripper out um hot air guns are quite good but you can you know you find your own preference and and, and scrape away i'm um, good a good uh random orbital sander helps um you do after a few hours of this begin to wonder why on earth you started doing <laughs> just insane <laughs> and you start you know covid's one thing with wearing all the masks but when you're down below in a boat covered with <laughs> dust uh it makes a hell of a mess uh, the actual varnishing itself is really quick you know you you can you know once you've done all the prep uh you can then um you know, you can paint it all over with varnish, well, two or three coats, um, you know, it's very, very speedy and, mm. you know, hugely satisfying. Um, so that was, yeah, that was a good, worth doing in my view. It just prolongs um, the life of everything and makes everything, you know, even if it's a minor update yeah. of the interior, but it just keeps everything looking fresh and will actually I, make it last longer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, um, I don't think I mentioned this yet, but one of the major jobs I did was um, on this boat. It's got a Beta 14 inboard diesel uh, engine and um, 14 horsepower, that is. And one winter, I took the whole boat ashore and um, the whole boat, the whole engine ashore, rather, and took it home. Is and that a picture of the before and after we've got there? You got a picture of the after on the right hand side. That's when it's gone back in the boat. Yeah, oh, I, nice. I scraped it right back. Interestingly enough, um, well, I'll tell you one thing I do want to say at this stage is that beta anyone with a beta marine, um, beta guys are so helpful. 
Uh, I couldn't have done it without their help. Yeah. I rang them up several times. Um, and obviously, quite a few of their clients have done the same thing in the past. And they'll, you know, they'll supply you with kit. I mean, yes, you could and should perhaps buy it from Force 4, but uh, a well, big job like, like this. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't paid to plug Force 4, I promise. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, I just, I mean, they were brilliant. So, and I think I might have mentioned to you before, James, but it was a bit like um, a 3D jigsaw. You know, mm. you can, you, you just take it to bits. Uh, you've got your manual. You're taking it step by step. You take photos. Um, you know, you're going to replace the hoses. You're going to replace all sorts of things that um, just perish with time. I'm going to get rid of all the corrosion um that takes a bit of time yeah. and uh in in my case what i did is i took the heat exchanger off because that had been leaking and i hadn't been able to fix it um so that did require some extra welding um so i took it along to an <laughs> this engineer this is definitely from... not a job for everyone isn't it <laughs> um no it's not an impossible uh, task but you're going to need a certain amount of space and everything else to do it yeah and then uh, and then a good mate again he helped me get the thing back in the engine i mean it weighs that particular uh, in the boat that 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 particular piece of kit weighs about 90 kilograms so uh it's a weight of a fairly fairly big big bloke so getting that back up uh into the boat was quite a was quite a challenge we actually used the yard crane for that um but you know that's that's an example where you're not going to do that first year of ownership you're going to do it a little bit further down the line um I haven't mentioned anything about safety equipment. Um, you know, those those bits of kit need to be checked through every year. The gas system, for example, needs to be uh, double checked. Gas pipes have limited life, and uh, it's a good idea to replace those before the expiry date. Um, so you know, um, pick a job and give it a go, and wow. uh, you'll feel very satisfied if it works well. <laughs> Well, I would I... say with that engine, it did actually start first button. We, we were really, <laughs> really chuffed when that happened. Yeah, I was going to say, I would imagine. Well, I think like we've gone through a lot there and there's a lot for people to consider. Uh, and I think it's just, again, one of the things to sort of reiterate uh, that some of these things are just checks uh, and inspections. They're not always going to be a fully fledged job. And you touched on something that I thought you hadn't mentioned, but and there's plenty that we haven't mentioned. I mean, it's it's a yeah. good book it's thorough there's lots in there um is there anything that we haven't covered or mentioned that you would just like to touch on before we go um okay uh how many hours have you got yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh well i suppose you know I, I i think i might have mentioned this but if i in case i didn't um i'd really focus mainly on grp boats here yeah um, which are probably the most common um the book itself we do cover wooden hulls and steel hulls and aluminium hulls because uh, they're all different and um most yards have a fair smattering of each of those so um that's covered um i haven't really mentioned anything about anti-fouling that the you know the anti-fouling of course is a really important task and that has to be done every year um course before it goes back in the water and i think it's always worth checking with your local i actually do go along to force war and uh, in chichester and i you know say what's the best anti-fouling would you recommend this year you know it does change year to year even but uh, um i actually last year i used cjet 33 which is really good for chichester harbour and when we lifted it out last week it looked really good i was i'm dead chuffed with that um but yeah so spend a bit of time uh doing research on the best anti-fouling to use uh, also it depends on the type of sailing you're whether you're doing racing or cruising you know there's a lot of choice out there and it can be a bit bewildering um so i do go into uh, there's quite a big uh, section in the book about um anti-fouling also on os osmosis as well uh which i know is a big worry to those of us who have older boats no um but I would say, finally, the best piece of advice I can offer um, is not to be afraid of asking for advice. You know, go 
not only to your chandlery and uh, other boat owners, um, your yard. Um, there are lots of forums out there if you have a boat that, uh, I mean, like the Westley Owners Association, you know, loads of owners there. Um, go to forums. Don't be afraid to ask people uh, what you think might be fairly basic uh, information that you need some answers for. And, you know, that will be really a good place to, to start. You know, it's a, you know, boat is a bit of a community. You know, people like to be asked questions and they like to help others out too. Um, it's not too challenging. Um, I say that, but yeah, you know, yes, certain engineering jobs are challenging. Um, it's good fun. Um, okay, anti filing's not fun. It's horrible. <laughs> um, it really is. I, you know, every year I say to myself, "Am I old enough now to get the yard to do this for me?" <laughs> I just go on doing it. It's bonkers. They did help me with some of the blasting off last year. Um, and, you know, enjoy it, you know, enjoy it. Definitely. It's, uh, it's not, it shouldn't all be onerous. And, you know, when you get the boat back in the water at the beginning of the season, it's all shiny and uh, polished and, you know, you put a lot of love into it. Um, it makes you feel good. And, uh, and also hopefully it will last uh, the season all right without breaking down on you. No, brilliant. Brilliant. Well, excellent stuff, Simon. Um, I think we've crammed just about as much information as we can without overwhelming people or hopefully not putting them off of their projects uh, and without covering your book cover to cover. Um, so thank you so much for joining us for this chat. It's been amazing. It's been very enjoyable. I've learned stuff from it or, you know, I've got an idea of the how people would use this book to do their own in the projects. So again, thank you for coming and talking about the Boatyard book that is out now. Well, thank you, James, um, for, for for that, and uh, and also for inviting me to take part. It's uh, I was a, a little bit uh, ang uh, app apprehensive beforehand, but um, <laughs> you've been brilliant. I'm really grateful to Force Four give us this opportunity, and uh, you know I hope if anyone you know wants to ask specific questions, I'm you know I I, I would be happily um, you know if somehow you can get in touch with me, I, I'd be happy to answer those. Um, you know, and I hope anyone who is uh, keen to buy the book um, really finds it useful. And uh, good luck with that. Good Brilliant. luck with your boat ownership. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, thank you to anyone that joined in out there online and or is watching afterwards. Thank you to Elise for working behind the scenes, getting those pictures for us. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>